Okay, I, I would just like to um, say very few words about how this uh, collaboration came about. I actually met Peter when I was 24. That was a long time ago. Um, it was a long time ago for him too, by the way. Okay. So, um, and over the years, um, our, our friendships have, um, you know, have been crossing over each person, each other's lives, and, and leaving a little, little imprint. And so we decided that it was a natural thing um, for us to collaborate. But what actually uh, cemented the collaboration was that in 2008, when I started a body of research based on the raw amber industry in Cyprus, uh, he was staying at our house and um, he said, show me, show me what you've done and uh, show me some of the images that you've taken. So I pull out my research and start showing off to him. And he looks at the image and says, I know where this is. And I said, no, you don't. You live in Australia. You don't know where this is. And, you know, claiming the site for myself. And it, it turns out that he actually knew exactly where it was because he stays in the monastery opposite the mine that I was researching. And he had it probably spent more days exploring my, the site that I was researching than I did. So we felt that that was an absolute perfect starting point. So having said that, I'd like to introduce Peter Lysiotis to you, and he will then present. It's 1941. Athens at night. Greece is occupied by Nazis. The swastika flies over the Parthenon. Two 19-year-olds, Postolo Sandas, who died last year, and Manolis Glezos climb up the Acropolis. They scamper up the Parthenon. They remove the swastika. Next morning, they're sentenced to death. They're not caught. This paper is dedicated to them because any act of rebellion should not be forgotten, but also because their act showed clearly how important the past is how critical it is to work hand in hand with someone else and how vital a sense of place is and also how important it is not to get caught. <laughs> so how easy is it to use the past? We appeal to it. We graze our imaginations there. We look for inspiration, even justification there. We are comfortable there because once we feel that most of our lot, especially once we feel that most of our life has already been lived. L.P. Hartley described the past as a foreign country where they do things differently. William Faulkner said that the south, in the south of the USA, the past never really passes. During the Cold War, Kurt Vonnegut was asked what it was about the future that scared him. He said, the future's fine, it's just the past that scares me. Uh, it was <coughs> Bob Dylan who said, don't look back. Trying to nail down places and histories is an endless task, but the two of us don't mind trying. So Helene and I would like to ask the past a couple of questions. Should we forget about trying to write the past and simply acknowledge that the past lives best in photographs? Is the past like a lizard's tail? Remember, our speech is beyond us, always past, lost upon being uttered. Each time we abandon what we said, it grows back. Look, it's a lizard's tail. Remember that piece of writing? That, or that image you made, or that photograph you took, or that poem you wrote? The one that was brought back to you on the shoulder of angels? Think back to that long journey. Do you recall how pale the words were? How fogged the image was? 
Is the person that's remembering as much about shuffling and selectively recalling as it is about embellishing and creating during the recalling? Is the past a fixed test, a text, or does it inevitably bow to our desire to create worlds? Caught in this process, the past is never exempt from being both created and recreated and created again. Eventually it becomes so frayed, so exploited, so picked over that what we make from it may bear only a passing likeness to the past we imagined we were rewriting. So we have to ask, does the central core of the past always remain untouched? How complicated is the act of recalling? Our pasts are delivered to us out of sequence. Bygone moments come to us either as a deluge of details leading us to organise and reorganise seemingly random happenings until all that is left is a perfect pearl of reminiscence, or so we imagine. Maybe our narrative begins with its end and ends with where it begins, which occurs, what occurs between is a series of false starts, untethered conversations, unanchored encounters. In this process, people can appear, vanish or switch roles at any given moment. At best, we are given the pieces of a story to stitch together both as it's read and as it's remembered. As jarring as the experience may seem, it evokes a familiar feeling. It feels real. The place we have chosen to set our work in and the place we have let uh, not only into our artistic practice but also into our lives is a small site around Brunei. We have become owners of this now. It's not Greek, it's not Turkish, it's not Cypriot, it's not Venetian, it's not Roman, it's not British, it's not Byzantine, it's not Phoenician. It's ours, Helene and mine. We look up to the dry hills and see the guard towers, the razor wire, the young men with automatics, and hear the military vehicles, the guard dogs barking, the young men yelling, and the sound of the white helicopter with the UN markings patrolling between these young men and another set of young men on the opposite hills. It's a mirror image, only the flags and language are different. Between them, no man's land, mine and the burnt out car carcass of a car. We come down these muscled hills into a valley and there we hear the monastery bells chiming, the monks chanting Byzantine hymns, cats meow. We walk over a grove with olive trees and beehives and cross the two-lane bitumen road. We come to a mine. Legend, legend has it that Vermeer insisted on using the umber from this mine for the shadow areas in his paintings. The mine is boarded up in places. We've seen the archival photographs of the workers there. Badly dressed, thin, dark, in teams, excavating. As they look at the camera, their gaze tells us that their ghosts want rescuing. These are the Ritzos' people. However, now there is the sound of trucks rolling in, carrying away their load. So in the small space, we have three distinct worlds, each of which usually guards its borders with its black and yellow striped tape, with its walls, its guards, its security, its fences. But it truly, the three worlds run seamlessly into each other. They're so close, there's no choice. The soldiers cursing, the monks chanting, the heavy machinery at the mine, it's all one song. And we are there to record that song. Is the song so big that it needs two people to catch it and write it? Or is it so small that it needs four hands to catch it and image it? We don't know. But we do know that two people working together, collaborating, have a better chance than one person of getting it. Are there reliable boundaries between imagined and real experience, between past and present? 
Is there anything that can't be made into a form of show business? And any form of show business that can't be made into art? So, is the choice between the motionless time of the past or the still time of the future? Is this past a sacred, cordoned off country existing in splendid isolation, just waiting for us to take the best bits out of it? No. For instance, capital has already broken the cordon and built an industry around it. We call it nostalgia. There are vintage phones, vintage signs, vintage suits, vintage dresses for sale. Are we meant to confuse this window dressing with the actual past? And if not as nostalgia, look at the fashion industry and see how it remodels the past according to contemporary values and anxieties. Look at the motor industry and see how the VW Beetle, the Mini Cooper, the Fiat 500 have been revamped and give, to give the present a warm and assured glow. Is the past we imagine or write or image just life with the boring bits taken out? We all look for, the wounds, for wounds to believe in and the best wounds, those that need the most picking, are in our past. In some ways a collaboration is an act of love in the sense that there is a partnership, a sharing, a working together and of course always the possibility of separation. But there can be also a spirit there encouraging and guiding both people to, do it, to go a little bit harder, a bit further than they would on their own. There is a voice there also saying Behind me there's a stream of work and behind her there is a stream of work. How do we unite all that? And have, uh, how do we unite all that? Are we there at the delta yet? Let them unite in a single strong river and we'll see. In a collaboration, you're never really aware of what you made of what you've made until it is made and once it is made. At our best, we might hope to be like Claude Levi-Strauss, who woke at five o'clock each morning to work on his tetralogy, Mythologics, always conscious, as he put it, of trying to be the place through which the myths pass. And at our worst, we look directly behind us and mistake our own shadow for the whole of the past. Isn't this where the worst writing and the image making occurs? We all know it because we've all done it. Let us imagine a drop of water on the lip of a terracotta jar, trembling, trying to hold on for another extra second to the idea of what it was. Let us imagine we are that drop of water. Is this the past? How original will our past allow us to be. Books from the past open out onto the books we write. The past helps us write our books because no person, no book exists on their own. What happens in the best art is the trade between the past and the present. For example, Homer's Odyssey opens up into James Joyce's Ulysses. The Byzantine icon painters open up to El Greco. Buster Keaton opens on to Samuel Beckett, and so on. What's happening to our past in the digital age? In yet another age where information is power. Will we have a past or merely an electronic file as we surrender our privacy and our lives to companies like Google and Facebook and to the alleged imperatives of paranoid governments. We have accepted somewhere in the past a time I can't recall, but you may, to give up bits and pieces of our lives. Our movements are taped, tracked, recorded, filed, all our details. These things that spark our imagination are being diffused by multinationals 
and government bureaucracies. Drink someone else's water. Under the watchful eye of the digital constellation, can we afford to be frivolous with our past and our writing and our imaging of it? In the end, we have to ask, how complicit have we been in the theft of our past, of our, of our identities? Or, alternatively, should we be grateful to be freed from them? Alternatively, can we shut down our past? Can our writing and our image making avoid it, run away from it? Well, let's forget about art for a moment and go to sport, something I know something about. <laughs> there are moments which go some way towards answering this question in sport. Zinedine Zidane, 2006, the World Cup final against Italy, the famous headbutt on Matarazzi. At the time, we all asked why. In a lifetime of football, he finally had enough of racist and personal vilification. He forgot that he was supposed to be a Frenchman. He remembered he was an Algerian. He didn't suggest, as perhaps a Frenchman might, that he and Matarazzi both enroll in Lacanian analysis. <laughs> no. The act, an act that had its beginnings in the past, the Algerian kiss, the headbutt, straight out of the past, no words necessary. <laughs> Does the past and its recording make special demands on those who have lived away from their places of birth? So, what are Helene and I doing at Drulli? Fossicking about, listening to the past while trying to uncover part of our pasts in the process. We were both born in Cyprus and we both left. Helene returned to live here and I come back looking for things. We're both Cypriots who have lived the majority of our lives elsewhere. We've chosen this narrow strip of land to contend with, and beneath its soil and in its air, we look for our past. We look for what our art can bear and what our making is capable of. We look for what we have become. It's a heavy investment. At the beginning of this talk, remember, Bob Dylan told us, don't look back. But he said that from the USA, and more specifically from New York, where the present is so powerful that there is no past. It's a sort of vision on which empires are built. So, Helene and I would like to say to Bob, do look back, but don't stare. <laughs> Are there any questions? I mean, not really a question, just like asking further in that sense. Thank you, it was a really nice presentation and I think it took us way back into the past. And, uh, so let's stay there. <laughs> but I just wanted to ask again where Helene started, like from the mind you were, because I lost the mind at some point, I think it only appeared at the beginning and I saw already like a little bit of your collaboration, I think, where you are actually like, you, where you then were starting a process of writing each other, is that right? Or can you tell us a little bit more than on like the mind and the current work connection? the kind of question you ask, the impact. Um, Suzanne, I started researching um, the Roranga region, Dully, and the mine um, way before I had discovered that Peter had a connection to the area. Which region? Roranga? Roranga. I will go. Roranga. Okay. Yeah. 
the region. Okay, it's a region just outside Larnaca. Okay. And so, if you go with Google Maps, you can actually see that the um, mountains are brown, very dark brown. Okay. Which is the raw amber that Renaissance and Baroque painters used as underpainting for shadows. Ah. Okay. And that was actually the trigger factor because. Um, Ages and ages ago, I was researching, I was just reading about Rorumba, but a friend of mine took me there very soon after I came to Cyprus. He lives in Anacrim. And, um, and I started researching about Rorumba, we were talking back in 92. And we, um, I started researching, and I came across this the, the paragraph um, that I actually confirmed because I wrote to, uh, I think it's a Dutch company that was um, involved in all the research, that um, under the underpainting for a girl with a pearl earring by Vermeer was actually um, painted with Cypriot raw umber. Because the Venetians, when they were here, okay, were actually trading raw umber and taking it back to Venice and then dispersing it because although Umbria in Italy is also famous for raw umber, the Cypriot raw umber actually has higher magnesium content and painters preferred that. Uh, it gave a more a stable and less uh, semi-transparent effect. So it was great for underpainting for them. And the Venetians uh, kind of took it. So I, I started with that discovery. I decided to research, actually, I came across the Vermeer because I was actually searching to see how many Renaissance paintings and Venetian paintings used Cypriot Roramba. Okay, so I thought well, that's an excellent cue for me to start researching this area because it's just in, literally embedded, not only with colour but with so much history. And then when Peter came and he asked me what I was doing, and I showed him, well, there was this connection because his first cousin is the abbot of the monastery, which is direct across, up, up on the hill, opposite the mine that I was researching. Okay. So it's this. You know, want to add to that? <laughs> <laughs> I think I added too much. <laughs> did, did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, just a small comment. I've been reading recently about uh, Facebook. Uh, and there was uh, a quote uh, uh, about Bob Dylan. And he said, if, uh, the writer said that. Uh, if Facebook had existed when Paul Dylan was starting uh, his uh, career, uh, what was his name? Uh, Robert Allen Zimmerman would have not been able to reinvent himself as Paul Dylan because all of the past would have been recorded <laughs> on Facebook. That's very good. That's very good. <laughs> okay, do you want to... Is that the <laughs> point? That was said. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, I, 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 I thought Peter, you know, did a great job of, of describing how, you know, the past is such a conundrum uh, in terms of, you know, what we, how we make sense of it, and how it figures in our lives, you know, and whether we should be ashamed to look back, you know, nostalgically, uh, or whether we should be, you know, curious about the past in order to learn lessons for the future, and so on, so on. And also, as, as, as sort of a, a migrant who has spent time away and, and, and has this kind of troubled relationship with with a country that you were born in and that your parents were born in, and yet you feel slightly alienated to. And I thought all that was really nicely dealt with in, in your speech. And it reminded me of um, uh, Borges. He has a lovely little. Apparently, his father used to put one coin on top of another, and he would say, "Well, this is the event as it happened. The, fir the first coin." And this is uh, when you last remembered it, and then on top of that, when you last remembered it, and so on and so forth. So, in fact, you're really a long way from home when you uh, when you regard the nature of the past, at least personal remembering, I guess. 
But um, anyway, I just put this out for what it's worth. Yeah, it's, <laughs> only, it's that notion of the ground that shifts yeah. is a lot more interesting than the ground that remains stable. It's just that's fixed here. Yeah. Ask Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, Jean Pierre. Jean Pierre. Well, we went a few days ago, some say that I think it's related. Um, this is it. The older we get, the better we move through. <laughs> 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 